with some administrative stuff, but which I'll have to wait until uh, <coughs> ultimately till Sam comes and hopefully Mike and Junjie. But anyway, here's the we got some scheduling to do for the course, the remainder of the course. For the next three lectures this week, thanks, Sam. This week and, and the next two, week, uh, and the next lecture, a week from today, will be normal, my lecture. I plan to, to take a lecture, or maybe a lecture and a half, on s summary for of the material in the course. And I'm planning for that to be again on uh, a week from Thursday uh, and finish maybe on part of, the, of that next lecture. And once I've done that summary, you guys, the six of you who are taking the course for credit will need to be preparing for an oral final exam. And so I will need each of you to make a, uh, a, um, an appointment for a two-hour oral final exam with me at some day uh, later than <coughs> uh, the 25th of April and no later than, um, no later than the 7th of, Mar of May. Okay, so please each of you propose a, a day at least when you plan to take your, uh, take your oral final. We'll also have oral pro project presentations. There are two times that are possible for that. One is at the final, the day of the nominal final, but we won't be having a written final then, on May 8th. And the other on the last class, which is the 27th of April. Three people have already said when they want to make their presentations. Sherry and, and, uh, and Nick have said that they want to do it on May 8th. And Yun Kuei has said he needs to do it on the 27th. Sam, when do you want to do it? May 8th. Okay. So, my guess is that the others will choose to do it as late as possible and on the 8th. Uh, it's, but in any case, everybody needs to be here on the 8th. I know, unfortunately, uh, Yen Kuei already has a plane to China on that day. He won't be, but everybody else needs to be, be here then to listen to the project presentations and to interact with questions. Um, okay, so I will be wanting Jun Jie and Mike. Are either of you on Zoom right now? Ah, there's one culprit person. Uh, I've just mentioned your name in vain. We're scheduling presentations, and your choice is May or April 27th. Thursday, April 27th, which is the last class period of the semester. It's two weeks from tomorrow. No, no, two weeks from tomorrow, but two weeks from Thursday. And May 8th is, I forget. Oh, it looks like no one looks to go off your people are doing 27th. I give you 27th. You want to do it on the 27th? Yeah, sure. Okay. So why don't you spell your name for me? Did I get it right here? Or? Uh, flip the Z and the, uh, Z and the S, N-I-S-E-N. Like so? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, and so we have Jun Jet yet to schedule. Jun Jet, are you there? Not there. <laughs> okay, so Up 
upshot is, besides the course summary, I have like three and a half lectures left to do. And we're going to start with the material I prepared for today. Any questions on, on all that? Um, okay, so we've talked, we've talked about a bunch of shape statistics uh, methods. And the question one commonly wants to ask is, okay, how do you know which one's better than one other? <laughs> and we've talked about uh, the cross-validation for uh, <coughs> approach. Uh, that can produce AUCs and ROCs and then value and evaluate classifications. We've talked about dipro-perm, which can uh, measure uh, <coughs> how, for how accurate a classification or a hypothesis testing can be. We've talked about using applications, but there's w one pair of measures that I want to make, I want to talk about that apply to the how good a probability distribution estimation you have made when you're estimating a probability distribution. Now how do you estimate a probability distribution? Well, typically by PCA or PNS. In any case, via these methods that that generate eigenmodes and coefficients of the eigenmodes. And ultimately, you're doing probability distributions on those coefficients, okay? And typically, we want to think of those as Gaussians if they're unimodal. But if they're not unimodal, we have to worry about uh, what what way to either uh, empiric with an empirical distribution or otherwise what they what form they are, but ultimately uh, somebody is doing how do I get this out of here? Go back to the bar. Hmm? I'm getting closed caption. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'm sure. okay. Okay, so <coughs> there are these two measures, generalizability and specificity, and it's worth discussing them. Basically, you have a probability distribution estimated from training cases. And based on that probability, and that probability distribution is on a shape space, right? And that shape space is spanned by the eigenmodes of the, of the probability distribution or somehow otherwise uh, specified. And the basic idea is to consider how a particular member of that training set fits the probability within the probability distribution trained by the remaining ones. So if you have, if you have n cases, you take n minus 1 of them, train from it, and you will find that that particular entity is not strictly in this shape space of with probability, non-zero probability. And so what you need to do is you need to project on, along a geodesic uh, onto the shape space and measure the length of that projection how far away you are from the shape space, okay? And that, for that one item, is a measure of how, its contribution to the generalizability. 
And you do that for each of the left out shapes. Train on the remainder, figure out how, it how much it projects. And that distribution, for example, the average distance, is a measure of generalizability. Okay? So, does, this is, does the estimated shape states actually capture real examples? Specificity, on the other hand, says how specific the probability distribution is to the valid inst instances of the object. Are there other objects that are, I mean, not other entities that are not valid members of the, of the, shape, of the shape space uh, that are nevertheless, in, I mean, nevertheless in the probability, but nevertheless have non-zero probability. I didn't say that quite right, but the point is that there may be other entities that we would not consider uh, valid objects that of the particular anatype we want to talk about, but which nevertheless can be seen on the, and to be within the shape space. And we would rather not have that. We would like the shape space to be only valid, valid objects. And you do that by taking the probability distribution that you've estimated on the shape space, and you, you randomly sample from that probability distribution. So that will give you arbitrary members of the shape space, whether they're actually correct anatomic objects or not. And then you look at, for each one of them, each random en en entity, you look at the, the data items that were actually trained from, and they, were, they are in the shape space. And you can measure a geodesic distance from each of them to, uh, to this, randomly, this random sample. And basically what you want is that those are far, that those are <coughs> far from the actual random samples. And so those two measures which were suggested by Rodri Davies in 2003 have been used uh, to measure the quality of probability distributions. Uh, Li Yun Tu, in her paper, uh, where she was doing, I've mentioned it already, she is doing work on, she was doing work on uh, entropy minimization based on SREP models. Uh, and she uh, <coughs> came up with shape spaces that come from the SREPs <coughs> of particular amounts of entropy. And so in her case, she had point distribution models that were on the boundaries implied by the SREPs uh, and improved means uh, look that the entropy has been improved, okay? Uh, and so if you try to do those using, in this case, the ShapeWorks approach, which optimize the position of boundary points, uh, in fact, I think that actually was using the Cates method for original boundary points. You see that his method uh, improved the, uh, the, ge the uh, generalizability uh, sorry, the specificity in the upper left. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, cumulative distributions. Uh, 
but that the SREP features gave you even better specificity. I remind you that specificity, smaller is better. It's a distance measure that you, that, uh, and, um, and likewise uh, for the hippocampi. And then the generalization methods, uh, there was less improvement. But the main point here is that there exist studies that done in the Manchester lab and at UNC comparing these measures uh, on um, on the basis of, um, sorry, comparing the probability distributions of various ways of ways of geometric features, in this case ways of improving the use of those geometric features, uh, according to these measures of generalization and specificity of the probability distributions they imply. Questions on that? Just trying to remember exactly what the, I'm pretty sure that the the numbers on the bottom were were values, yeah, okay. The, it's just sorted order values for the 30 objects in the population. Okay, the next topic is multi-entity analysis. So, so far we've acted as if our objects are single objects, right? Uh, and we've talked about doing classification based, for example, or hypothesis testing based, for example, or segmentation of those objects, right? And anatomy does consist of single objects. And you have multiple objects. Likewise, if you have a, a set of objects and they all have a sort of a common sort of protrusion. You may well describe this object as a host, which has some s rep like so, and a subfigure, which is the protrusion. And so you have two entities. Another example is shown in the upper right of this slide. On the top you have a caudate, in the bottom you have hippocampus. And strictly speaking, you have not only the geometric descriptors of each one of them, gives you two entities, but you have a linking surface that I described earlier that is sort of halfway between the two and links from each object to them. So you have four entities, the links from the hippocampus to the linking surface, the links from the caudate to the linking surface, and the descriptors, ge geometry of the caudate and the geometry of the hippocampus. And so again, you have multiple entities, each with geometric descriptors. And the question is, how do you go about doing statistics like classification based on this collection of entities? OK, likewise, if you had a third object or a fourth object, you could do that. And some, now and then, some of the objects have, like you see in the lower right, uh, a part of the object boundary that's shared between the objects. <clears throat> well, the method that I'm going to be teaching you uh, was originally called AJIVE, <coughs> Angular Joint and, uh, and Individual Variation of Entities, or something like that. <laughs> uh, and just has been renamed by, DVAS, 
and there's a paper. That paper is on the Google Drive. And I recommend that you read it because there will be some questions on this on the exam. Uh, anyway, um, the basic idea is that, for example, a disease, it's known beforehand that for autism, the kind of behavioral changes that kids have once they start showing autistic symptoms are the kind of things that the caudate nucleus and the hippocampus are responsible for. So you have reason to imagine that the disease could jointly affect both organs, and maybe affect the connections between them that are somehow related to their relationship in the brain, <laughs> their physical relationship. Well, the idea is that here is this. that the space, essentially the shape space <coughs> probabilistic description can be understood as a component of features, a subspace that has features <coughs> that jointly vary. Okay, so the disease affects both of them in a correlated fashion. And if you're in class K, you also have individual variations that are not correlated with the other entities. K runs over the entities. And then on top of that, you have features that are just noise. And so the, <coughs> the objective of DVAS or HI is to figure out what J is and what I1, I2, up to I capital K R, where there are capital K en entities. So we're trying to divide our shape space, <coughs> our shape features, into new linear combinations of them, such that a bunch of these new features is are in the joint distribution, and others are in, are in the individual variation of only object one, and the other only object two, up to, well, in this example, I could have talked about four, capital K could have been four. Okay, as you'll see, the and the result that I'm going to quote you, a capital K is going to be two, just the hippocampus and the linking features from it. But anyway, the idea is that, first of all, getting, getting rid of features that are basically about noise is a good deal. You, you don't want to do your classification based on noise. And secondly, there are a variety of situations where the joint features are the ones you want, you want to do your classification on. Or you can say, I want to do my classification on the joint features and one particular <coughs> one <coughs> uh, entity that is particularly strongly varying between the classes, but not the other ones, and so on. 
So the <laughs> basic idea then is to be able to do this uh, division of entities in the first planning class as being in the joint state space plus its individual space plus its noise. And to do that for k equals 1 for each capital K. So the things in the second, the training entities in the second class are in the joint space and the second individual ob object space and its noise. Clear? Any questions so far with the, what, what we're after? Okay, so this just basically says what I have, <laughs> um, but with one particular in, uh, <coughs> situation. The, uh, if you think about it, each training case <coughs> has a bunch of features. Feature one, feature two, up to feature. What have I said here? <coughs> okay, so let's be careful. It's going to have feature one, feature two, up to feature D one. That's how many features there are for the first entity. And then it's going to have feature D1 plus 1, feature D1 plus 2. Feature D1 plus D2, right? It's going to have D2 features of the second of the second entity, and so on, down to feature D1 plus D2 plus plus DK, right? So the point is that the feature every training entity, in, in our case, <coughs> the two, op, the, the, op, the hippocampus and the links are going, every training entity is going to have a hippocampus with its geometric descriptors, with its features, and a set of links with its set of features. And if you had a, wanted to also have the, get the the uh, caudate, then you would uh, hit that same thing would have the features of the caudate. Clear what I'm saying here? Okay, so every single entity has <coughs> features of each of the categories. And of course, there are many training cases. one, case two is going to be all these features. <coughs> and so, lots of training cases, right? And <coughs> I am going to assume this is not a requirement of the method, but it makes it easier for me to describe it. It's something that's quite common, that the number of training cases, case n, is few, few relative to the total number of features. You have lots of multiple entities, each with lots of features. And that's the normal situation in shape analysis, that you have lots of features. And typically, well, often, relatively few training cases. 
so this decomposition of XK <coughs> is you have these K blocks. Um, <coughs> And what we're going to do is PCA or PNS on each block. That is to say, on each one of these categories. One for the hippocampus, another one for the links, and so on. Okay? And for each one of them, its DK is greater than N, so the PCA is going to end up with n minus 1 non-zero eigenvalues, right? I mean, that's what happens when you have on a, a PCA analysis on, on only n, little n entities. And the result is that you can now have each one of these blocks have only <coughs> once it's that once you've done this eigen analysis instead of this situation <coughs> you have f1 f2 up to fn minus 1 for block 1 that is to say for entity 1 <coughs> and and then F, oh well, okay, I'm just going to renumber it F1, F2, up to Fn minus 1 for block 2, and so on for however many blocks we have. Okay, so now instead of my features being the original features, they are the coefficients of the, eigen, of the eigenmodes with non zero eigenvalues. And the, the effect of that is to have thrown away the dimensions of the space that are so far already that are noisy. Yeah, questions? Okay, so I'm trying to understand this. So we're deleting, so each XK, is, so we're doing the PCA over each block separately. No, we're going to do the PCA, <coughs> well, yes. You're right. So far, we're doing the PCA over each block signal, right? Absolutely. So, and a block corresponds to a single object, or no, a block is uh, all the measurements. Okay. So, this uh, is a block. block in the sense of block. A block is an entity. Okay. And this is the features of that entity. Clear so far? Oh, I see. Yes. It, okay. So, so these are the features sense. of of object one, and these are the features of object two. So we're doing PCA on the features of each block separately. Each block separately. And then we'll go, I guess, then we'll go into <laughs> and so the What that yields is a bunch of an eigenspace of which only n minus 1 of the uh, eigenvectors have non-zero eigenvalues. Okay? And therefore, every xk can be written as a linear combination. Every xk, the block, each block of xk can be written as a linear combination of n minus 1 coefficients of those eigenmodes, right? Yeah. And that's what these guys are. The coefficients, these guys are coefficients of the, of the eigenmodes of block one with non-zero eigenvalues. And these 
these guys are the same, but for block two. Dimensions with, oh, z oh zero as in, the eigen, yeah, zero, the eigenvalue of is zero, which, and, okay, so we're not, so basically it's a projection into the eigenspace of eigenvectors without. That's right. Questions? What is XK? XK is the, oh, this guy. This whole thing is XK. I'm sorry, let's be careful. No, uh, no. Uh, yeah, X, this, sorry, this is X1. Uh, I think you have K, K, K blocks. Yeah. I've got it right. Uh, Sorry, let me not be. Uh, <coughs> Um, so each each training sample is an X1 concatenated to an X2 concatenated to a cap X capital K. All right. That makes sense. All right. And what we've done is we've made each one of these, after our analysis, to be an n minus one tuple. <coughs> n minus one tuple, so it's like a vector, or it, it's one dimension. What? So it's one dimension, like it has one index. It's got n minus one. It's an n minus one tuple. It's an, it is. It's a representation of something in n minus one dimensional space. Okay. That's <coughs> the okay. coefficients of the eigenmodes of that for that block. So far. So we we have the block. <coughs> I think. Okay. So. Okay, but the but the I just to be clear the eigen. Where is this one? Oh, this had a lot of features. Now it has fewer features. Only right. n minus one. But it's still every case, every training case is now <coughs> restricted. We, we took this, these guys and we dot producted them against those eigenvectors that were the ones with non-zero eigenvalues. And that gives you a coefficient of that eigenvector. That makes sense. I, but now I don't understand what we're taking the eigenvalue. Because I thought you said it was we did it separately for each f x k. Separately for each. What are I guess what are the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues of. They're the eigenvalues of this thing over all the cases. Oh, okay. So it's okay. So it, it is a matrix. Yeah, these things are the eigenvalues of block. Uh, sorry, the features of block one over all the cases. And then you have the features of block two over all the cases. Okay. Oh, and then and we're assuming that this is a wide matrix, that because dk is bigger than that. Yes. So that's gonna mean that it can only have at most n eigenvalues. Right. So wait, actually that's another thing. What happens wait, what we're restricting it to n minus one, but there couldn't there be n non zero eigenvalues? No, there are n minus one <coughs> when you have n cases. Okay. 
work out work out what 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 happens when you are actually in a in a one space subspace one dimensional subspace of of three dimensions. You'll see how you'll see how it works. Uh, anyway, fine. The main point here is that I have lowered my number of features in each class to the same number. The method in general doesn't require that. You can, but you're going to lower the various blocks to to be of some appropriate rank. Um, but what we want is these modified multi-block features to rewrite them as <coughs> joint features plus individual features. And what the way the math works out is you, you have a space of this dimension of each of the training cases. And usually, the analysis that we're used to, we do analysis across the features. And here we're going to talk about the space of the rows, the space of the cases. <coughs> and we're going to say, for the cases, which are the common modes of variation in that space of cases. Uh, so we, we, in our case, we have a kn, k times n minus uh, 1. This should be n minus 1. k times n minus 1 dimension. And we're going to want to break, break those dimensions into a space of only joint features, which are going to be linear combinations of these various features, all these guys together over the blocks, that are going to be a subspace of this space of this feature space overall feature space. We're going to have a subspace of it. That is the joint feature space. <coughs> and it's a space of lower dimension than this overall dimension of k times n minus 1, right? And we're going to want, and that space is going to be spanned by eigenmode vectors, with spanning orthogonal vectors, a frame, and form a subspace of the, the overall space. Uh, and we're going to want that the space in which all the individual variations, the ones that aren't joint, are going to be orthogonal to the joint space. Right? So we have our example here. Consider the three space as if, our, if that's our overall feature space. And here is our joint space. It's a subspace of that three-dimensional space. And all the individual spaces are going to be orthogonal to it. In this example, there's only one dimension left for the individual spaces to be in. OK, but the idea that, okay, is that the individuals are going to be orthogonal to it. We 
within an I space, an IK space, it's going to be also spanned by its own eigenvectors. But we don't require that the individual, the individual space for block one and the individual space for block two are orthogonal, are orthogonal to each other. <coughs> okay? That's how this thing is set up. The surprising thing for those of us who are used to doing eigen analysis essentially in feature space is that the eigen analysis is done in data in data item space. In this high dimensional space of which we're trying to find these joint subdimensions. And the basic notion is that if I have a, a three space of features associated with block one and a different three space for block two, that the joint features are ones that line up together as a linear subspace of those you take, think of the, the, this high dimensional space of dimension six, but there's a subspace of that where the features of, of block one and the features of block two are correlated, which means they line up together in a subdimensional plane. And so the, the, the analysis that you end up doing is called principal angle analysis. And it finds sets, linear combinations of the features of, of the two blocks that line up in planes. Well, they don't line up exactly in planes. They end up being small angles between them. And as it says, the hard part is choosing the rank of J. How many dimensions are we going to make that have adequately small angles? Because you'll have you know, some dimensions with quite small angles and other dimension which has somewhat less small angles and so on. And the contribution of Vivas over Ajive is that there's some very nice hypothesis tests to help you or to tell you what that rank should be. Let me turn this into actual things you could, you could man manage to compute. So you have x sub k, <coughs> the collection of x sub k over the cases, x sub 1, for example. Its eigen analysis produces eigenvectors, eigenvalues lambda sub k, some of which is 0, and can be, <coughs> because it's a non-square matrix, that you don't get a, you, you get the left and right eigenvectors appropriately. What you're doing is rewriting xk as the matrix u sub k times the, the diagonal matrix lambda sub k times the matrix v sub k tr transpose. Okay? So far so good? For each block, we've, <coughs> we've done SVD. And Essentially, <coughs> this the entries in that VK corresponding to the eigenvalues that are zero will essentially lop off the uh, <coughs> any contributions to that part of the space. 
And then what you end up with is you have various <coughs> V sub K transpose groups. Okay, in my example with two, it's easy. You have the ones from the hippocampus and you have the ones from the links. Those are the two entities. And we're going to look into that space, which is two n minus one entries wide, and we're going to figure out within that two n minus one dimensional space, what is the subspace that has uh, <coughs> small angles between appropriate linear combinations of those features. And it turns out that the, that the calculation you want to do is <coughs> finding these features <coughs> that are, that have an, a small angle. <coughs> You're trying to minimize over the features of, <coughs> in the first block and the features in the second block with these requirements of orthogonality, what the, um, what are the ones that have small angles? <coughs> the features. What? Like, so these are the, these are the right singular vectors. So we're just trying to find the combinations of, of, v, of v, yeah, just pick the ones that together right. have small angles. Okay. Exactly. This thing is, I'm doing a, what I consider to be a truly impressive job of presenting this, and it's hard. Okay. In other words, the, <coughs> the general notion is what I have described. The actual computations you can see that you could probably compute. And what that does is it yields this capital J as long as you have an adequate sort of cut, cut off on which, how many features are going to be in the joint space. And that's going to be done on hypotheses on these angle differences. <coughs> okay, so AGIVE was built on two, two blocks. Well, no, that's not quite right. <coughs> AGIVE was built on capital K blocks and the only way you could have joint spaces was all of the blocks. The joint space is in reference to all the blocks. So it's joint among all the blocks. So if you had two blocks, it was joint among the two blocks. Right? But Divas now says you may have things that are joint between, if you have three blocks, you may have situations, uh, you may have feature two combinations that are joint between one and two, but not joint with three. And others that are joint between two and three, but not, by, not with one. And others that are joint between one and three, but not two. <coughs> and Divas allows that kind of sub-block combination. I mean, sub-block different combinations of blocks being jointly, jointly different. And you can imagine that all this stuff has to do with eigen, with analysis of histograms of eigenvalues and of angles. And so it turns out that the analysis that I described earlier that I called Marchenko Pasteur analysis turns out to be the, a piece of how the, the how this rank choices and so on is developed. It'll become a bit clearer, I think, with an example. 
So, in this first work by Zhou Yun Liu, his objects were the two objects of the, the, hippocam one, the hippocampus on the one hand and the uh, caudate on the other. And each case had one of each. And the features were PDMs. So you had the PDMs from the caudate, the PDMs from the hippocampus are the two blocks. And in his case, the PDMs that he generated were SREP implied PDMs. So you, so you had SREPs that had been fitted to each of the hippocampi and SREPs that have been fitted to each of the caudates. And those spokes of S the SREP ended up with boundary points at the spoke tips. And they uh, were the points that are in this PDM. So for each object, the fitted SREPs, spoke ends, were the points that you see here on the top for one of the objects, the caudate, and on the bottom for the other, the hippocampus. OK. Uh, and so what he did was he did, P, he did PNS on each of them separately. Right, the hippocampus PDM on the one hand, and separately PNS on the on on the SREPs from the other the uh, what did I say? The one with the hippocampus, the other is the caudate. Right? And that PNS is essentially the counterpart that I said of lowering the dimension and getting rid of some of the noise. It's just that instead of doing sub-dimensional planes in a feature space, since these, these, these SREP, sorry, these PDMs live on a sphere, their shape is a sphere, it's sub-dimensional spheres, but you still end up with a, a set of coefficients of the modes of variation, and these are here. Okay, so this was generated from PNS and not from PCA. But it's still the case that you get only n minus one dimensions. <clears throat> yeah? Um, has anyone tried, so a method I worked with in undergrad a lot was that you can get a pretty good low rank approximation by just randomly generating vectors which are with, and then projecting into that space. Has anyone tried that? Randomly generating which kind of vector? So what you do is, you, I guess the way it works is you just pick the rank of J, and then you random, you generate um, a matrix of that's uh, with the requisite dimensions, such that that just, the entries are just randomly drawn from the normal distribution. But you, you, that, the whole problem is you have to find the J in the first place. Oh, okay. The way we do it is we ju we just kind of picked one. And so far we haven't got a J. We've just got okay. We've got block one space and block two space. I guess it's a different problem. Then. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then he took those two times n minus one features and did a jive on them. And then he did evaluation of, well, he did, did DWD on just the joint features, which was way fewer features than you had to start with, right? He also did DWD on all the features, all, all of this. with the zero eigenvalue ones removed, but otherwise all the features. 
Anyway, to make a long story short, he found that in this particular case, because apparently the disease, the joint behavior of the disease was the, the most important behavior, but the classification based on the joint features alone was better than including either the individually varying features and certainly not the noisy features. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Or the, well, I, I understand what you said. Okay. He went on, though, to look at not PDM features and not object by object, but SREP derived features. Okay, we're familiar with what they come from. They come from the spoke directions and the <coughs> and so on, As, and the, the spoke lengths and the positions of the the fitted frame kinds of things. In fact, he did use fitted frames, uh, and he had. So that's why it says and using a affine frames. So in his S fitted S-reps at every, at various positions in the, within the object uh, out, along the various onion skins that he used, he had these frames that came from the diffeomorphism from the ellipsoid in, uh, applied to ordinary frames, orthogonal frames, unit vectors, mapped into the, on, Onto the object at the various uh, at the various onion skin points, and he had okay. So he had this whole bunch of SREP features, and he had them for object one, the hippocampus, for object two, the caudate, for object three the links from the caudate to the linking surface, and for object four, which is the links from the hippocampus to the linking surface. And he did various combinations of agi. Basically what he tried first was, first of all, ordinary classification object by object. How, how good a classifier is the hippocampus alone? How good a classifier is the caudate alone? And he found that the caudate was a very much poorer classifier than the hippocampus was. But the hippocampus was not good enough, but way better than the caudate. And so he considered the two block situation where the hippocampus was one block and the links to the linking surface were the, was the second block. Not very much information in those in those links, they are just a, each one has just a direction and a length. Each link. Um, on the theory that the, maybe the caudate and its links were going to be noise. Notice, however, that the caudate the caudate's geometry seriously affects the linking surface. Right. So the the linking surface is defined by the combination of the hippocampus and the hippocampus spokes and the caudate spokes. But then he threw away the actual connection information from the, it and let, the, let it, the caudate only be represented in this by essentially how it affected the linking surface and thus the links from the hippocampus. Anyway, what he ended up, he did a whole bunch of different comparisons of what gave better classification. And what one was joint analysis between the 
two between the caudates SRF features and the caudate to linking surface links. And that beat hippocampus base classification, and it beat hippocampus and karate together classification. <clears throat> In fact, he had the surprising result that adding the karate in low. Um, but separately. Hmm? But not the joint. Uh, yeah, harmed, well, put another one. If, when he did just hippocampus and caudate alone with no linking surface, no linking information, and on, on the one hand, and analyzed the hippocampus alone by itself, it turned out the caudate harmed slightly the classification rather than helped. And that was a part of the reason he said, I eh, better not include the caudate itself in the, in the uh, overall jive analysis. So anyway, there was um, very interesting result that is, uh, has been accepted in a paper that will shortly appear in the International Journal of Computer Vision, IJCV, which is a very prestigious journal, uh, about, the, about this approach uh, of doing multi-object classification that includes not just the objects themselves, but the inter-object inter relationships, and all done with a jive kind of analysis. Okay, I'll mention that when he did it, DVAS didn't exist. DVAS is brand new. And so he had to make assumptions on the ranks by hand waving, looking at, at some looking at the kind of data that, but not with a careful hypothesis test. Okay, one final point, and that is, what about objects that aren't separated, that have overlapping pieces of surface? And in that situation, this, what you want is that the spoke in that region of shared boundary, and things are nasty because you, everything is uh, discrete and made out of discrete mesh elements, and trying to get to decide exactly what do you mean by it actually sharing the position. But if you if you do if you make reasonable uh, approximations that are smooth and that smooth things share boundary. What you want is that the spokes coming out of one object, let me draw it, we have one object here, you have another object that shares part of the boundary here, whatever, this was intended to be shared that in this region, you want the spokes that come from the red object and the ones that come from the blue object to be collinear. Okay, and there's been a little bit of introductory work on toy objects. Uh, uh, by, um, why am I blocking on his name, Akash, uh, got his, ba his bachelor's degree here in the department recently. Krishna. Hmm? Krishna, is it? Yes, thank you, Akash Krishna. Uh, that, where he managed to figure out how to get the spokes to be in agreement. And then the basic idea is that the linking surface here is for the part of the linking surface, you have zero link links, but you have a des designated designation of the direction of the links, nevertheless, which are across these common boundaries. And you found in toy in toy toy examples that this 
kind of a linking surface, which would be, well, in his case, he only used that part, but what you'd really want is a linking surface that continues on past there. And that that produced useful classifications. Okay, so this was a long presentation of a complicated matter where you have multiple entities and you're trying to understand a subspace of joint features and separately subspaces of individually varying features. Is a new and, and that you can do statistics on just the joint of the joint and individual one of the joint and individual two, uh, and uh, and that's uh, and in his particular example, only the joint produced the best classification of that particular data set. But there are other situations where you can imagine it. One object's individual variations is, is also important. Okay, so th that's the end of that topic. As I say, complicated. I'm happy to take further questions on it. Um, the next lecture is going to be on longitudinal analysis of shape, where now you have not just a shape at one time point, but a shape varying across time. And the typical example is effects of, for example, aging, right? What happens to a shape, or shape tuple, but in this case, a shape, as you move through uh, the, how old that, that object is. Uh, it can also be applied to um, cyclic kinds of things like lungs breathing and hearts uh, beating, but I'll restrict my attention to the situation where you have a time span and you have uh, a bunch of objects, <coughs> uh, you have object descriptors for different subjects across time, and you want to do statistics on the variability between those, those ways they develop over time. And so we will be doing longitudinal analysis for next, le for next lecture. I'm pretty sure I will fill up next lecture, maybe a, bit, a little bit more. And that will leave me with about a lecture and a half in which I'm planning to do uh, some combination of currents and defermetrica and uh, nur uh, nurse, yeah, uh, which are, gives an, a different object representation. And I'll do, some, do, as I said before, summary and so on. Uh, I hope to get information between now and then from uh, from Jun Jet as as to when he wants to give his his uh, project presentation. See you next time. <laughs>